Let's say we have a function f that takes in a vector x, multiplies x by some matrix a, and then returns the length of that resulting vector. f is a function that takes in a vector. Uh, so if it's an n-dimensional vector, uh, it's a function of n variables, one variable for each component. And the length of a vector uh, is a scalar, so the, the output of f is a scalar. Uh, so we have a function uh, that takes in a vector and outputs a scalar, so we could ask what is the gradient of f? It turns out this is the answer, but we'll go through a few derivations of this, uh, starting with a, an intuitive visual derivation. For the rest of the video, I'm just going to use single bars instead of double bars to, me, to mean length, uh, just to save space and time. Again, f is just a scalar valued function of n variables. So we could uh, get rid of the matrix vector notation and write out explicitly uh, in terms of all the components of x and a uh, what the length is. It's going to be the square root of the inner product of ax with itself, which uh, is just a sum of the squares of the components of AX, and then each of those is itself a sum. So ultimately, it's just going to be the square root of a, a big sum of uh, quadratic terms, but we're not going to start with that. As a warm-up, consider the following scenario. Uh, there's some location, the origin, and you want to get away from that place. And so, so far you've walked away and you've made it to this point. And you want to get away from the origin as quickly as possible and continue to do so. So once you're here, what direction should you walk to get away from here? Well, it's certainly not this direction because you're getting actually getting closer to the origin if you go this way. And it's not this direction either. This is orthogonal to your current position relative to the starting place. You don't want to move orthogonally because uh, that actually basically keeps your distance the same. It's like you're beginning to go in a circle. Like if you tie a rock to a string and spin it around, the rock is always moving orthogonally to the center of the string because the string doesn't let it move further away. And that's what causes centrifugal force. The direction you do want to go is to continue going the same direction you've already been going. That's how you most quickly move away from the origin. You'd still be moving away from the origin if you took some other step uh, like this one, but that's still not the uh, quickest way to move away from the origin. You'll see why in a minute this example is relevant. Before we get to the gradient, we could first look at the directional derivative uh, in some direction v. And the directional derivative of f in the direction v, or with respect to v, uh, can be derived this way. We introduce a parameter t, and we start to add v to the input at x, uh, and as we increase t, the input travels along v. And we look at the instantaneous rate of change with respect to t of this, uh, right at the very beginning when t equals zero. So that's when we first begin to depart the point x moving in the direction of v. Uh, our instantaneous rate of change as we do that is the directional derivative of f with respect to v uh, evaluated at x. Here I've just written out f explicitly. f is the function that takes its input, multiplies it by some matrix a, and returns the length of that result. So uh, f of x plus tv will just be the length, again using single bars, of a times x plus tv. If we apply the limit definition of the derivative to this, we get this. It's the change in the function f uh, divided by the change in the input t, the limit of this as t approaches t naught. Uh, so here we have the length uh, 
when uh, at t when we've added t times v and here we have the length when we've added t naught times v that difference divided by the change in the input but remember we were only interested in evaluating this at t equals zero so i've added in that notation here and the limit expression becomes more simple when we don't have this t naught it's now simply just the change uh, in in length between ax and a x plus tv divided by t the limit of this as t approaches zero i've now erased the limit notation and replaced the equal sign within approximately equals sign uh, and said for small t so what we're going to do uh, to get visual intuition for this is look at a, a small but not uh, infinitesimal change and it will be a reasonably valid approximation for small t this is what will be happening in our input space we have some initial point where we're starting x and then we have some vector v along which we're going to take the directional derivative and then we'll have some small t uh, that's going to shrink down v to just a small step so this will be tv and the limit definition will be uh, you know when we're taking t closer and closer to zero uh, but we'll just look at some small discrete tv step so we have some input x and when we apply the linear transformation a matrix multiplication to x we get out some initial output ax then we add to it some small step tv and then that takes us to this new position x plus tv and we take a similar step in our output space a times tv and that moves us to a new position a times x plus tv and because matrix multiplication is a linear transformation that is equal to ax plus a tv linearity means that applying the transformation to a sum of two inputs uh, results in the sum of the two respective outputs uh, and we could actually also bring this t out because t is just a scalar but that won't really help us the same way that separating the sum is helpful so now we just want to look at this picture and come up with a geometric argument for what the length of this uh, new a x plus a tv is what is the length of this vector to help make the argument i've drawn two dotted curves that are supposed to look like uh, two segments of a circle the first circle is the one centered at the origin with a length or a radius equal to the length of our new vector ax plus a tv the second is the circle also centered at the origin but with length uh, equal radius equal to the length of ax so you could say that by adding a tv to ax it moved us from one circle to another circle uh, it shortened the radius from the origin and it also rotated us a little bit but even though there was some amount of rotation uh, the key observation to making the approximation that we want to make is that uh, these lines ax and ax plus atv are still close to parallel they're close to parallel because this very small segment of this circle and of this circle between uh, the two spans or whatever you want to call it of the two vectors uh, is so small that it's uh, locally appears to be close to flat so what we'll do is essentially pretend that we have a rectangle here and to emphasize that this is almost a rectangle I drew uh, two right angle signs in these corners since we're just interested in what was the change in length uh, when we moved from ax to ax 
plus ATV, taking this small ATV step. We just need to know uh, how much did the, these radiuses change. And clearly, uh, the change in radius between these two circles is uh, basically the length of the side of this rectangle, this side, uh, and equivalently this side, if it's indeed a rectangle, then they will be the same length. And the length of this side of the rectangle is just the component of the step we took, ATV, along the direction of our initial vector. So that would be the length of the projection of the step we took onto the initial vector. That's what this side is because this is approximately a right angle. So what we've derived is that the difference in length between a times x plus tv, our new position, and the length of ax, our starting position, is for small t approximately the length of the projection of atv onto ax, the length of the step we took, uh, the length of that projection onto the direction we started out. Actually, this should really be the signed length of the projection because uh, in this case, we actually uh, decreased our length. So the change was negative. Uh, so uh, the projection of the step we took onto our initial vector is negative in the normal way we compute the projection length in linear algebra. So that won't be a problem. So we just derived using a visual argument that for a small change, a small t, uh, a small step along v away from x, uh, the difference in length, the change in length, is approximately the length, the signed length, of the projection of the step we took onto our starting place, the vector representing our starting position. So it's uh, that's the projection of ATV, the step we took, onto AX. And we know from linear algebra that the length of the projection is just the dot product of the vector we're projecting onto a unit length vector uh, in the direction we're projecting onto. So we're dividing AX by its length to normalize it, to convert it to a unit length vector and we're dotting that with ATV, the step we took. And we also know that the dot product between two vectors is the same as uh, one vector transpose times the other vector. And we can also bring out the T from the TV to the front because it's just a scalar. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the length of that projection. And here we have A transpose A, which is sort of the first hint of the fact that we'll eventually be looking at the eigenvectors of A transpose A. And remember, we set out to find the directional derivative of AX with respect to V. And we decided to do a finite approximation instead of a, a limit uh, of the change in length between AX and AX plus TV divided by a T for some small t. And then we also used our visual argument to come up with an approximation for the numerator here. So if we take the result and plug it in here, the t's will cancel. And once the t's cancel, we're just left with the projection of AV onto AX. It's worth noting that this expression does not depend on the length of x. It only de depends on the direction of x. But it does depend on the length of v. That's because if v was twice as long, then for the same small t, we would have moved twice as far in that direction. Let's double check the result that we got from the intuitive visual argument with a more rigorous approach. Here I've written out uh, the exact formula for the length of our new vector where we end up when we take a small step tv. We have the square root of the formula for the squared length. This is essentially the law of cosines. 
uh, we have the squared length of the first vector plus the square length of the second vector plus two times the inner product of those two. And you could think of this as the two cosine theta length of the first, length of the second uh, part of the law of cosines formula. So when we take the derivative with respect to t, uh, first we use the chain rule. We, uh, for the outer square root, we pull that down to the denominator as two times the square root, which is uh, just the length. And then uh, this term disappears because there's no t in it. Uh, we could have pulled out a t squared from this term, so we just use the power rule and we get 2t times this length. And this term, we could have pulled out a t, and uh, so that's just t times a constant, and so when we differentiate, it's just the constant. Then when we evaluate this de derivative at t equals 0, the bottom length just becomes the length of ax. Uh, this term disappears because it has a t in it, so when t is 0, this becomes 0. Uh, this term does not disappear because there's no t left in it after differentiating and then the twos cancel. And so we're actually left with the answer that we already got. So it turns out that that answer was exactly correct and not just approximate. And you could roughly explain the fact that our approximation turned out to be completely correct in the limit uh, by the fact that this term has a t squared in it and this term only has a t in it. So when t is very small, this term vanishes much more quickly than this term. And so once we've taken the derivative, this term goes to zero when t is zero, and this term does not. So we figured out what the directional derivative of f is in some arbitrary direction v. How can we use that to get the gradient of f? The gradient of f, uh, f being a function of n variables if x is n-dimensional, will actually be an n-dimensional vector itself, but we'll write it as a row vector. Well, the gradient is just the vector of partial derivatives, and the partial derivatives are just the directional derivatives uh, in the coordinate directions. Uh, so, you, so that's essentially the directional derivatives with respect to each of the unit basis vectors. So that's with respect to i, with respect to j, and with respect to k in three dimensions. I've now used the uh, result we got for the directional derivative uh, and, and plugged in i, j, and k into this definition uh, in place of v. We could factor out the scalar in this uh, denominator of each of these terms, uh, ax. We can factor that out. There's actually more that we can sort of factor out. Uh, so x transpose a transpose a, that much of this will be a row vector. And then when we multiply it by the column vector i, that will turn into just a number. But what does multiplying by the vector i do? That just extracts the first component because i is just 1, 0, 0. So that matrix multiplication just pulls out the first component of this row vector. And likewise, j just pulls out the second component, and k pulls out the third. So here we have the first component of some row vector, the second component of some, that same row vector, and the third component of that same row vector. So what this is, is just that row vector. So we factor out the 1 over ax scalar that occurs in all of these terms. And then we've observed that uh, multiplying this same uh, left three uh, pieces of this product times a, then j, then k, actually just takes out the first, second, and third components of that vector. So we can just write that row vector. And this is really the gradient of f evaluated at some input x. This should not be uh, in any way magical or surprising, so let's look at it in another way. If we uh, come up with names for the columns of a, say a, b, and c, and we name the uh, components of x, x, y, and z, sorry about the fact that 
it's named x and the vector itself is named x. Uh, they don't mean the same thing. Then the partial of this expression with respect to y uh, is the infinitesimal change that we get uh, when we add a little bit more of b to the total because as we increase y a little bit, uh, y matches up with the b column. So we're adding uh, a little bit more and a little bit more of b to x times a. And as we increase z a little bit, uh, we add a little bit more of the c column to ax. So we can read this entire expression here as the uh, row vector containing the list of projections of each of the columns of A onto the current position, ATX. So here that is written out. Uh, this should be the side length of the projections, but there's always so much space. Once again, the partial derivative of this full expression, this function F, with respect to X, Y, and Z, is by the visual argument we made just the respective projections of the columns uh, of A onto our uh, starting position. So if we start out at AX, this vector here, and we want to look at the partial uh, derivative of the length of AX uh, with respect to uh, Y, so uh, in the j direction, we just need to uh, look at where we're going to travel as we increase y. Well, as we increase y, we're going to uh, be adding a little bit of aj to ax, because j is the uh, unit basis vector corresponding to y. And aj is just b, the middle column of a. So as we uh, increase the y component a little bit, we travel in the direction of the B column. And as we increase Z a little bit, we travel a little bit uh, along AK, which is the C column of A. So we can just apply the same visual argument we made earlier to each of these, except, except instead of uh, moving the input in some uh, arbitrary direction V, we're just looking at moving it in uh, each of the coordinate directions, which just corresponds to moving the output uh, in the directions corresponding to each of the columns of the matrix. So we're pretty much done with this. We found that the gradient of f of x, where f is a function that takes the vector x, multiplies it by a, and outputs the length of that result, uh, the gradient of this is x transpose a transpose A all over the scalar length of AX. And you can interpret this as uh, the row vector containing the list of projections of each of A's columns onto the current uh, vector, the current value of the function uh, a, tr a times X. Uh, and just to look ahead a little bit, uh, as you often do, once you have the gradient of some function, you can plot it as a vector field, uh, where at each point we uh, draw the, uh, the gradient of the function at that point. And uh, what we'll find is, uh, if, we're, if we're plotting this gradient here, and we consider all the uh, inputs x, in some circle around the origin, uh, something special happens when the gradient lines up with the position vector. And uh, that's where the whole eigenvector thing comes in because we have an input, our position, lining up with A transpose A times that vector, uh, normalized, well not normalized, but divided by a scalar. Uh, and so that's just a, a little bit of the eigenvector flavor.